I'm happy to introduce Marcy from the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. I don't know whether anybody's been there, but it's a really an amazing place. Uh, I hope I noticed on their email, I mean on the website that they're now open. So it's a place you guys can plan a trip to. Um, it's really definitely worth visiting. It's a, a great place. I'm gonna let um, uh, Marcy start in just one moment, but I, one more program I wanted to announce. This uh, program is gonna focus on the uh, um, epidemic uh, in uh, Philadelphia primarily, but in about a month, we're going to have another program from the Historical Society that will focus on um, our area in particular too. So we can, it's really, you can put them together and uh, that might be really interesting. And there's the event information right there. To go, I'm gonna let Marcy go on and I just noticed somebody else just signed up. I'm gonna go let them in. Sounds good. All right, so good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to listen to my talk this uh, evening. Um, just to give you a little bit more information on uh, my museum. Uh, it, the Mutter Museum is located in Philadelphia and it is um, a medical museum. And it features anatomical specimens, instruments, models, books, um, all of which speak to the history of medicine over the past few hundred years. Um, it is part of an organization called the College of Physicians of Philadelphia, which is the oldest medical organization in the country, founded in 1787. Um, the museum began in um, 1863. And um, yes, it is true that my talk does mention Philadelphia for a little bit, but you have to understand that when we developed this lesson uh, called Spit Spreads Death, which I'll explain, um, it coincides with an exhibit that we put up in the museum called Spit Spreads Death. And it's, um, it was put up in the fall of 2019, uh, but we had been planning this exhibit for probably four to five years before that. We put up this wonderful exhibit detailing the 1918 uh, pandemic and then less than six months later, a new pandemic broke out. So it was totally coincidence. Um, but when we planned this exhibit, we obviously planned it to focus on Philadelphia, um, not only because we're in Philadelphia, but because Philadelphia was the hardest hit in the country. Um, but we will mention that a little bit. If you have questions, please feel free to type them in the chat. Or if you are not the best typer, if you wanna unmute yourself, I guess, That'd be fine too. Um, but if you could stay muted just for the duration of the talk so we don't have any other background noise. Um, and then at the end, I'll come back into this forum here and then we can chat for a little bit. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Yes, okay, great. So if you need to type something in the chat, please feel free. Um, I would love to talk about that. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll talk to you a little bit more about how you can access our museum from your own couch. Um, some digital stuff that we've got going on, which is really fun. All right, so um, as I mentioned, this lecture is called Spit Spreads Death about the influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1919. And you can see that that sign there up on the street sign does say the same thing, spit spreads death. We will talk about the whole spitting thing a little bit later on in the lecture. A um, little bit of humor there for you. So today we're going to um, talk about the virus that caused the 1918 influenza pandemic. Uh, we'll focus on the role that World War I played which was actually quite a big one, as you can imagine, um, how the public health officials responded, um, how the pandemic affected future scientific and public health responses. And then um, there is a final slide on there about how you can reduce your risk of contracting influenza, which I think we're all intimately familiar with um, at this point. 
So what is the flu? Um, I apologize in advance if you are aware of all of this, but it's kind of background information for us. Uh, influenza is a respiratory illness caused by a virus. Um, that's why you can't take antibiotics for it because um, they do not work on viruses. There are four categories, A, B, C, and D. Um, and what happens is this virus, um, whatever strain it is, um, gets into your system and it infects healthy cells and tricks the cell's DNA into making more of the virus's DNA instead. And then the viruses kind of overwhelm the cell, the cell bursts and unloads all these viruses. And then they repeat the process over and over again. And this is called the lytic cycle. Um, it can appear in other species besides humans, uh, birds, pigs, horses, cows, um, A and B, are the typical ones that cause um, the, the influenza that we're most familiar with that we get our shots for every year, seasonal flu. Um, strain C causes mild symptoms and has not been connected with pandemics and D is found only in cows with no connection to humans. Now, um, we know we get a flu shot every year and that is because the virus is always changing. It's always mutating through something called antigenic drift. And that is when there is, it's kind of a continuous process where um, the, the, it goes through a subtle genetic change, just a little bit changes in it. And last year's flu shot is not effective against it this year. Um, however, once in a blue moon, the flu changes through something called antigenic shift, where it's a, a sudden dramatic change in the flu's DNA, where it becomes this new unique strain of the virus that your immune system is not prepared for. That's what happened in 1918. Um, there was kind of a first wave in the spring and then it underwent a dramatic change into a deadlier strain that hit us in the fall. And then there was another strain, another um, wave in the winter. Um, so symptoms of the flu were the things, again, that we're very, very familiar with these days. Uh, sneezing, congestion, watery eyes, fever, headache, chills. Um, if these things are left unchecked, then they can lead to complications like you can see there, ear infections, um, worsened respiratory symptoms, especially in people with asthma, uh, pneumonia, organ inflammation and failure and sepsis, and it could lead to death, unfortunately. The question is what made this particular virus unique? Why was it so deadly? Well, one thing that's notable about this flu, and you'll notice it's called H1N1, the H and the N stand for proteins that make up the flu. So it could be H2N3, H3N2, H1N1. Um, so that it just refers to the, the type of protein that makes up the virus. Um, so one thing that's notable is it caused an unusually high death toll. Between 50 and 100 million people died. Um, this is just absolutely outrageous um, how many people died. Um, current studies estimate that at least a third of all people were sick um, and about 25% of the earth's population uh, died, which is the 50 to 100 million. For example, because of the war, we lost 20 million people, World War I. This caused more deaths than the war. Um, another thing that um, came along with this particular flu strain were the symptoms um, that were very life-threatening, including bloody phlegm, uh, fluid in the lungs, and a bluish complexion, which is called cyanosis. And I'll show you a couple of photo, uh, not photographs, um, illustrations of that in a moment. Um, but one of the things is 
that made this particularly unique was who was getting sick and dying during this flu. Now, during your traditional flu, the people who get affected, the people who get infected and could die are the very young and the very old. So if you were to graph the distribution between age of the individual and the number of deaths, it would be shaped like a U. So it'd be the very young and the very old. In this one, in the 1918 flu, a group of young people were dying too, between ages 20 to 40 years old, and it caused a W-shaped mortality curve, which is the solid line there. The dotted line is your traditional flu. Um, there are many theories that say why the young were getting sick at this point. Um, again, these are all theories, we're not sure. Um, one of the theories says that this particular flu triggered a very aggressive response um, by the patient's body called a cytokine storm. So what happens is the, the infection from the flu causes the body to secrete these proteins called cytokines, which cause the lungs to become inflamed to fight the infection. And it causes a lot of fluid to build up in the lungs and it causes uh, lung cell damage. Um, another theory says that um, a lot of people were getting this opportunistic bacterial pneumonia. And then a third theory says that in 1888, there was an outbreak of something that they nicknamed the Russian flu. And the people who survived the Russian flu in 1888 were now better suited to fight off the 1918 flu. But the young people who hadn't even been born yet uh, in 1888 were now in their 20s, 30s, 40s. They weren't equipped to deal with this sudden impact of a flu virus. But again, these are all theories. We're not quite sure. So here's um, some illustrations from our historical medical library. This guy is quite blue. Uh, this guy's lips and ears are blue from the loss of oxygen in his system. Uh, the chest x-ray on the left there is from a patient who has influenza and a chest x-ray should be black, meaning that air is in the lungs. But in this one, the, the right lung in particular is, is more white, which means there's fluid in the lungs. And then on the right is an illustration of the lungs of a patient with what they call red lung pneumonia which is a secondary infection caused by the flu. So let's discuss now the effects that World War I played uh, on the pandemic. Um, and when you think about it, it kind of makes sense um, that this pandemic took place during the, the years of world, the, the end of World War one, um, we entered the war in April of 1917, and we started mobilizing troops around the country. Scientists believe that it either originated in northern China or in Kansas and or in Kansas. Um, the first place that it appeared in the United States was in this Camp Funston in Kansas. Then you've got troops mobilizing and moving around the country. And if they're sick, they're gonna take the flu with them. So that's, that's a, big, um, a big problem right there. Um, you know, you've got people moving into these densely populated areas, um, refugees fleeing war zone, people moving all over the place. And these sick people are gonna spread the flu. Um, into the healthy population. Um, let's see. What was uh, medical understanding like in 1918? Well, luckily we believed in germ theory, which is what we still believe in today. Um, and just for comparison, uh, there were two other theories of disease prior to germ theory. <coughs> Pardon me. One was called miasma theory wherein people believed that bad air would make us sick. Um, miasma means bad air. And then there was another theory called humoral theory, 
where uh, doctors believe that the body was composed of four different humors or fluids, um, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. And if your humors were balanced, then you would be healthy. However, if your humors were not healthy and off balance, you would be sick. And to um, make you feel better, that usually involved a lot of bloodletting. But we had come to the state of believing in germ theory because of people like Louis Pasteur. Uh, we knew that these germs could cause disease. However, we, uh, scientists were only able to see bacteria under a microscope. They had no clue what viruses were because they're so tiny. Um, viruses, you can fit six million of them in a single drop of blood. So they don't show up on a traditional microscope. Um, when the flu broke out, researchers are looking under the microscope. They're trying to blame it on something. And um, one thing they, they thought maybe it was caused by this Pfeiffer's bacillus, um, which is a bacteria, totally wrong. Um, but they had no understanding of viruses. Um, another problem is that the flu wasn't a reportable disease unless you died. So we still are not sure who got sick and recovered because it wasn't a reportable disease at the start of the outbreak. Um, there were no coordinated health, uh, public health responses beyond the local level. Um, different communities had different responses to the pandemic. Uh, I'm sure when you hear your talk about your area, there was one type of response, Philadelphia had its own. Some were successful, some were not. Um, and then scientists did try to develop some vaccines to prevent the flu, but they didn't work. They even tried other vaccines like typhoid fever to try to ward off the flu, but that just isn't going to work. Um, the propaganda that was going on at the war tried to kind of downplay the impact of the uh, pandemic on the war effort. Um, so, some of them didn't even address it at all. Newspapers were told, don't talk about it. Um, Woodrow Wilson, our president at the time, never made a public uh, statement on the war, I mean, on the pandemic, and he actually caught a lot of heat for that after it was over. Um, but the press was told to downplay it. We don't want to panic people. We don't want to worry people. A lot of people blamed it on Germans. They said it was German warfare. Um, but you may have heard that this particular flu pandemic was called the Spanish flu. And I've gotten this question, why is it called the Spanish flu? Um, it actually had nothing to do with, this, with um, Spain. Uh, Spain was a neutral country during the war. So they were able to cover it in their newspapers. And because they were actually talking about it, a lot of people blamed it on them and said, oh, it's the Spaniards, it's the Spanish flu. Um, but it actually had nothing to do with them. A lot of people came to major cities during the war for jobs. Uh, Philadelphia was no exception to that. We had a lot of people, we had um, lots of people come to Philadelphia for work, uh, thousands of people. Um, and we had um, jobs available in factories, textiles, mills, munitions plants, and shipbuilding facilities. Um, we have a Navy yard um, and a shipbuilding yard there in Philadelphia. Um, women were taking up jobs as the men went to fight. Uh, Philadelphia is also close to a couple of military bases, kind of sandwiched in between one in central Jersey, one outside of Philadelphia. Uh, the first cases of the flu in Philadelphia occurred at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, which is down kind of near the river, um, near the Delaware River, probably brought in from Camp Devers in Boston. Um, however, it's kind of hard to isolate exactly when that happened because it wasn't a reportable disease. Um, now, if you notice in the gentleman's sign on the left-hand side there, it says, don't be a miser, buy a bond and lick the Kaiser. Um, what was going on at the time in our country, <coughs> pardon me, is that people were being encouraged to purchase liberty loans. 
Liberty loans were bonds that you would basically invest in the government. And then after a while, they would pay you back with interest. Each major city has it, had its own quota of Liberty bonds that it was supposed to sell. Philadelphia's quota was $500 million, which is an awful lot of money. It's about $8 billion in today's cash. So we had people hanging up signs. We had um, volunteers going on these campaigns, encouraging people to buy Liberty loans. Uh, the Liberty Bell on the left-hand side poster there is made up of people um, shaped like the Liberty Bell. And um, they also had a lot of patriotic gatherings in Philadelphia. <coughs> Pardon me, guys. Allergies are a bear. Um, so the epidemic is happening. We've got things going on in the city, but yet people are still gathering at these patriotic uh, gatherings, Liberty Sings, where they were singing patriotic songs. Um, the organizers in the city decided they wanted to throw a parade to encourage more people to buy their Liberty loans. Um, physicians in the city and public health experts were encouraging the parade's organizers to cancel. Um, there was a rise of the flu going on. Um, however, um, they were ignored. Um, part of this is because of two acts, uh, the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, which made it illegal to openly criticize or give the appearance of interfer interfering with the war effort. So um, they, they went ahead with this parade. Uh, I see a hand up. You have a question for me. If you wanna unmute yourself, Alexander, that's fine. No, oh, okay. Um, so they held this Liberty Loan Parade on September 28th of 1918. Um, it was extremely well attended. There were over 200,000 people that attended this parade that marched straight down um, what we have in the middle of the city, which is called Broad Street. Within three days after the parade, every hospital bed in the city was full. They were turning people away. Um, a lot of uh, private businesses and private residences were kind of commandeered as emergency hospitals because so many people were getting sick. Uh, the coroner's office was overrun um, and the death numbers just skyrocketed starting in early October. Um, October 6th, the number of deaths exceeded 500 for the first time. And this is just in Philadelphia, not nationwide. Um, the deadliest day was uh, October 12th, where we lost 837 people. Um, all told, Philadelphia lost 17,500 people um, during the course of the epidemic. Um, okay. um, one big problem that we had is that a lot of doctors and nurses were overseas. So they weren't here to help treat people. So um, what happened was a lot of doctors who were in medical school stepped up to act as nurses. A lot of private citizens were asked to treat their families and neighbors. Um, let's see. The city kind of finally responded and they posted these posters all over the city encouraging people to do or don't do certain things to avoid the flu. And some of them do make a decent amount of sense. Don't congregate in crowded places. Um, don't allow yourself to become fatigued. Don't sleep with the windows closed. Fresh air is good germicide. Um, so some of these things held true and some didn't, and they post them 
in many different languages around the city. Some of the treatments for the flu, if you were able to get medical attention. Um, during the first few days, they would kind of limit your diet and they would avoid broths because they thought that broths, especially meat broths, were bad for the liver and other parts of the body. Um, after a few days of limited diet, um, it was followed by buttermilk and fruit juices. Um, doctors also advised uh, foot baths, heated compresses on the back, um, enemas, and then finally, alcohol, especially whiskey. Uh, this was a common treatment for influenza. And uh, there was a problem with this though, because in Pennsylvania, there was a statewide ban on saloons. So it was very difficult for people, especially doctors to get their hands on this whiskey. Um, our, our coroner in, nine, in October called on the governor of Pennsylvania to loosen the ban stating that, um, that high-grade whiskey was indispensable in the treatment of influenza, um, but he was um, kind of ignored on that one. <clears throat> uh, despite the ban, a lot of saloons were offering to fill prescriptions for whiskey. Let's see. Uh, October 3rd, the Philadelphia Department, our Board of Public Health and Charities decided to uh, closed down. They banned public gatherings. They banned churches, um, schools, libraries, uh, saloons, even though those were banned. Um, so that, that, there was a Philadelphia ban on October 3rd, followed by a statewide ban on October 4th. And that ban continued a whopping three weeks until October 31st. And then the ban was lifted. There we go. Okay, spitting. Let's talk about that. Um, after all, the, the lecture is called Spit Spreads Death. Um, public health officials believe that the disease was actually spread through spit. So the city imposed a ban on public spitting. Uh, people caught spitting in public were subject to a fine of $2.50, uh, which is about $40 today, and they could be arrested. Um, the director of the Department of Public Health and Charities published a statement in the local newspapers um, stating why he thought that, uh, why you shouldn't spit. And it said that careless spitting could spread this disease. Um, you know, spittle adulterates, I'm reading from the statement here, because spittle adults the atmosphere, which we, we must all breathe, because spittle may be carried home by shoes and skirts, um, things like that. So they believe that spit would actually carry the germ, which it kind of does. I'm not saying that's totally wrong, but once that spit hits the ground, it, you know, it's not going to be necessarily carried home. So um, the city set up official hospital, uh, emergency hospitals to handle the flu pandemic. Um, and then private citizens set up makeshift hospitals. Now I couldn't find any Philadelphia pictures to fill this grid here. So instead, we have um, Oakland from California and then um, Walter Reed in Washington, D.C. But we had some in Philadelphia just like that. And you may notice a bit of a parallel with COVID that they did this in other cities around the country. The same thing. They set up like the Javits Center, um, Madison Square Garden. They, they operated these places like emergency hospitals. Um, we had volunteers driving ambulances. We had um, local places setting up emergency, kind of like a hotline phone number that you could call and say that you had somebody with the flu and they would send emergency help your way. <clears throat> Problem, space. Um, a lot of times uh, these bodies were buried in mass graves because we ran out of space to, put, to bury them. And we needed to get them in the ground quickly because a lot of people believe that they could still spread the disease. Um, you know, maybe, maybe the disease could still be spread even after they were gone. Um, so they were buried in mass graves, but a lot of the coffins were marked so that after they could be dug up and reburied perhaps somewhere else. Uh, uh, undertakers were price gouging people. 
they would charge somebody as much as say $75 for a coffin. And then they would resell that coffin to another family. We ran out of coffins. They were taking pine uh, boards and just building these makeshift coffins because we ran out of them. People were dying so quickly. Now, again, people just waiting in line to be embalmed, um, to be buried. Um, so the personal toll that was happening in Philadelphia, um, about 100 bodies that were unclaimed became anatomical specimens at the local medical schools. Um, a lot of local cemeteries took to burying some people where they could. Um, there's another thing um, in Philadelphia, there's a place called Gerard College. It's actually not a college, it's more of a private, uh, like a school. Um, they accepted over 340 boys that were orphaned by the pandemic. Um, here we've got some obituaries of some people who lost their lives. So we've got this um, exhibit that we built, which I will tell you how to access in a little bit. Um, the, the exhibit talks about the flu, and it's not a particularly object heavy exhibit because there's just not a lot out there that we could get our hands on to demonstrate the flu. We've got some nursing equipment. We've got a couple of wet specimens that show pneumonia, which can be a secondary infection from the flu. Um, but what we do have is a lot of things that showed the personal toll on people. Um, on the left there is a purse. And this was a Christmas present from somebody named Naomi Ford. Um, she had done all of her Christmas shopping in early October and wrapped all her gifts and put them in the attic in her home. <coughs> um, unfortunately, she died of the flu. Her family was so heartbroken over her death that they didn't unwrap those gifts for a very, very, very long time, perhaps decades. When they finally unwrapped them and saw what they had, they donated them to one of our local universities, Drexel, um, in their costume department. And they have loaned them to us to put in this exhibit. And one of them is this purse that was for her Aunt Helen. Um, let's see, what have we learned? Um, not much at first. The, um, the United States was kind of slow to act at the beginning. Um, the, the US didn't establish a national uh, organization for coordinating uh, epidemic responses until 1946 with what they called the Communicable Disease Center, which is now called the Center for Disease Control. Um, the virus that causes the flu was not able to be seen until the invention of the electron microscope, which wasn't until the 1930s. So um, the influenza virus was first isolated in 1933. They were able to start creating vaccines, antiviral medication, um, things like that. The first influenza vaccine became available in 1946. So think about that, that's almost 30 years after the pandemic. Um, now, this stuff I don't think I need to read. It's stuff that you already know how to avoid your risk of the flu. Um, but I will tell you a little bit more information. Um, since 1918, there have been, I have to edit my script for pandemics. In 1957 to 58, there was an H2N2, which they called the Asian flu. From 1968 to 1970, there was an H3N2, they called the Hong Kong flu. <clears throat> From 2008 to 2009, there was a novel H1N1, which we called the swine flu. Some of you may remember that. And then of course, the one that we're stuck in the middle of today. Um, some other little facts. Where is that stack there? Um, every year 
in America, there's between 12,000 and 56,000 flu deaths every year. Um, we are just over a year of COVID and we've lost over 500,000 people. So um, this is pretty, pretty devastating to us. And you can draw your parallels, if you will, between what happened in 1918 and what happened today. Now, being as though this is a program for a library, it would be remiss of me to not mention any, uh, mention some books that uh, have to do with um, this flu. And they don't just focus on Philadelphia. <clears throat> I have to pardon myself for coughing, I'm so sorry. So some of the books that I would like to mention to you. Uh, the Great Influenza by John Barry. There's one called As Bright as Heaven by Susan Meisner. Um, William Maxwell wrote They Came Like Swallows. Uh, Catherine Ann Porter wrote Pale Horse, Pale Rider. And then there's one called uh, The Orphan Collector by Ellen Marie Wiseman. Um, so at this point, I would like to talk to you guys a little bit if you've got any questions for me or anything like that. Um, if you wanna talk about any questions that you have for me, either unmute yourself or free feel, to, feel free to type in the chat. In the meantime, while you guys are kind of getting your questions ready, um, I'm gonna throw something in the chat here. Oops. I apologize, I don't know how to make link scale. Um, so that's our website, which is muttermuseum.org. And we have a lot of things that you can do on our website from home. We've got, um, we've got a page on there called the Mutter at Home page where you can do, um, there's coloring books and there's videos and quizzes and things like that. Um, we also have a huge channel on YouTube. So if you are uh, so inclined, if you go on YouTube and just type in Mutter Museum, we have a channel. You can click on that and then you can see a ton of videos that uh, we've got there including a virtual tour of the Spit Spreads Death exhibit. We've got a virtual tour of the museum itself, the whole museum led by our curator. Um, so if you can't make it down to Philadelphia, you can still access us virtually. So I encourage you to do that. So thank you for attending and thank you, Marcy, for um, My pleasure. joining us tonight. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate your time tonight. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.